that defends you against the state is legitimacy and the rule of law. That the state always has access to an all-powerful cryptanalysis tool, which is called rubber hose cryptanalysis, which is when they tie you to a chair and hit you with a rubber hose until you tell them what your passphrase is. It really doesn't matter how many uh, bits you add to your key length or how strong your, your, your password is if there is no way to check the illegitimate exercise of state power. And so I've come to understand the power and promise of cryptography as on the one hand, providing a temporary shelter, a place that is shielded, albeit imperfectly, from the illegitimate exercise of state power in which we can use the temporary respite to plan uh, the reforms and the demands that will make the state more responsive and legitimate. And on the other hand, shifts some of the equilibrium because states that are tilting towards illegitimacy have to reckon with the possibility that the, the people who live there will be able to resist them through cryptographic tools. Author, journalist, and activist Cory Doctorow returns to the Plutopia podcast discussing his latest sci-fi novel, Attack Service. Corey joins John and Scoop in the virtual studio, and he's armed with opinions on just about everything. <clears throat> Welcome to the Plutopia News Network. Today, Corey Doctorow returns. Corey is a science fiction author, activist, and journalist. And his latest book, which we'll be discussing today, is Attack Surface. Uh, it's a standalone adult sequel to Little Brother. He's written many other books, including Radicalized and Walk Away, which were science fiction books, the great How to Destroy Surveillance Capitalism, which is a nonfiction about monopoly and conspiracy, and In Real Life, a graphic novel. Also a picture book, Posey the Monster Slayer. He's also a special consultant to the Electronic Frontier Foundation a nonprofit civil liberties group that defends freedom in technology, law, policy, standards, and treaties, and an organization I've been supporting for many years as well. And we appreciate it. Oh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. I'm actually, uh, I'm wearing my EFF shirt today. Oh, I'm not wearing mine. We could have been, we could have been twinsy. So, Corey. Did you have this sequel in mind when you wrote Little Brother, or did this kind of come to you after the fact. Yeah, quite the reverse. I had no, well, it's actually a funny story. I got to the end of Little Brother. Uh, I wrote the first draft in uh, uh, exactly eight weeks from the day I had the idea to the day I finished it. Um, and I got to the ending, I realized I didn't know how it ended. So I wrote an ending that was a cliffhanger. And I thought, oh, I'll write a second book and it'll be set in Southern California. It'll be all about Disneyland because I love writing about Disney theme parks. Uh, and then I sent that off to my agent, my editor, and they were like, we love this book, but this ending is stupid. And so I had to ditch the ending. Uh, and um, I wrote a different ending, and then it was going to be a standalone. And in 2012 or so, I got an itch to write a second one. So that's how Homeland came about. And then I thought I was done again. And then about, I guess, 2017, I had this idea to write a book that I was then calling Big Sister. That was about this character, Masha, who I'd become increasingly interested in since um, I, I started writing the series. Uh, and, and particularly, I was increasingly interested not in her, but in the story of people who talk themselves into doing stuff that I can't imagine doing. And what, what goes on in your mind when you decide to, to fight for stuff that shouldn't exist in the first place uh, in exchange for a fat paycheck. And Masha is a great character. Um... You're, you're writing across gender there. Did you have any challenges in, in writing a, a really good three-dimensional female character? Well, I mean, John, as you know, all men have incredible insight into the uh, lives, inner lives of women. <laughs> so it was no problem at all. Like, I, I hope you're right. I mean, so far, the women who um, have read this book have been kind about my treatment of this character. Uh, it is a dilemma for all writers, and particularly for writers who sit at the top of the privilege gradient, uh, do you um, acknowledge that as someone who sits at the top of the privilege gradient, you cannot really understand what life is like for people lower down on the curve, uh, in which case you, um, 
exclude them all, altogether from your work, which is not a great outcome for anybody? Or do you try to put yourself in their shoes, do your best, uh, recruit uh, sensitivity readers, and do all the other stuff that is necessary to try and um, uh, dig into what that person's life is like? And so I, you know, obviously opted for the latter. It's not the first time I've done this, although uh, this book has more female main characters than most of the books I've written. I think that any of them, uh, except for the maybe the novella um, uh, Unauthorized Bread, but it's it's pretty up there. Uh, you know, there's there's this idea of the Bechdel test, where uh, a a book or a film is only even worthy of base consideration if, if there are at least uh, one conversation in which two named female characters have a conversation about something other than a man. And, you know, <laughs> I've, been, I've been trying to make that the minimum standard that my work rises to for, for a while now. Uh, Corey, you use a lot of technology in the uh, story that uh, relates to existing technologies, unlike a lot of science fiction, which just comes up with some strange thing that mm -hmm. is hard to believe. How, how much research went into developing these extensions of these technologies that you use in the story? Well, you know, the work that I do uh, is um, flips the research question on its head because so much of both the policy work I do for EFF and the writing I do on tech and policy, uh, I was a co-editor of Boing Boing for 19 years. I still remain a co-owner of it. And now I write an independent um, online publication called Pluralistic at pluralistic.net. And that work, um, it, it, what it is, is a, it's a, a combination of activism and uh, note-taking and synthesis that whenever anything crosses my transom, that seems like it is relevant to the wider questions that I'm interested in, I try and summarize what makes it interesting to me. Uh, and explaining that to a notional audience of strangers requires a rigor that simply making notes for yourself in a commonplace book doesn't really rise to. Uh, I, I'm sure everybody can, can sympathize or, or can recall instances in which they've made notes to themselves that they later couldn't decipher. When you're writing for strangers, you don't have that luxury. You really have to try and be crisp. And then if you do it every day, you end up with a kind of emerging synthetic experience of what's going on in the world where all of these little fragmentary nuclei of ideas, they start to glom together and make little molecules. And so, you know, you get more synthetic, longer, more interesting pieces. And eventually they'll, they'll form like a superstructure, they'll crystallize into something that is much bigger than that. And so, you know, in, in one sense, I was researching this book for 10 years. And in another sense, I did almost no research at all for it because most of the stuff that was in there was stuff that I knew about because I was trying to figure out I was trying to trying to research all the things that were interesting and decide what book I could write about them, rather than deciding uh, to write a book and then figure out what interesting things could go in it. One of the scariest weapons you describe in attack surface is based on something being promoted by that great champion of civil liberties, Elon Musk. He recently stated that full self-driving cars will be a reality in the near future, and yeah. your self-driving attack drone cars are not that far-fetched. Well, so, you know, let me be clear. I think that people who claim that we're about to have self-driving cars are smoking their own product. Uh, we are nowhere near to having self-driving cars. It is um, the self-driving car. The only thing that's going to crash worse than the cars themselves is the market for the cars. But but that all said, um, this the genesis of this was, I can actually track it down to a specific thing. It was the Sydney Writers Festival in Australia. And I went to see a panel on AI and ethics. And there was a guy at the front of the room, I A, don't remember his name and B, wouldn't want to embarrass him. There was a guy at the front of the room on the stage who was saying the kind of half smart, stupid thing that people say about AI and ethics that made me crazy. And what he was saying is, well, maybe you've heard of this trolley problem from the 1960s where um, it's a moral philosopher's dilemma in which uh, you have an imaginary trolley that is speeding down a track and it will either crash into a school bus full of children and kill them all, or um, you can flip the, the switch and it will track, it crash into just one individual person who's uh, hanging out over there doing his thing. And who do you kill? 
And in the context of a self-driving car, the trolley problem looks more like this. You're in a luxury Mercedes and it can decide whether it's going to murder a school bus full of children or drive you off a bridge and murder you. Which person should your car murder? And the reason this drives me crazy is because the thing that is unspoken but happens before this, uh, this thought experiment unfolds is that the um, car is designed to murder its owner and for some reason the owner is not able to reconfigure it so it doesn't ever murder them. So we're starting from the premise that this is a car that allows third parties to set potentially lethal policy on it that kills the person inside of it. And by design, the car cannot be uh, overridden by the person who is about to die so that it never kills them. And you know, once you accept that this is the design our car should have, that user modifiability creates more harm than good, that technological self-determination is a value that we sacrifice in service to solving hypothetical moral dilemmas about school buses full of children and driving off a bridge, then it's only a matter of time until someone figures out how to subvert that system. Either there's an insider at the firm who seizes control of the system, or there is a, um, uh, a third party who hacks the firm and seizes control of it, or there's a state that exercises its uh, legitimate authority to order the firm to use the, the car in a certain way. And as soon as that happens, by design, the people in the car die because by design, whoever is setting policy on the car does not have to worry about the person who is in the car about to die changing the car's priorities. And that is like a manifestly terrible idea on its face and shame on anyone who thinks it's a good one. So your murder cars all have DRM and back doors. Yeah, well, DRM, in, in a sense, a DRM is a backdoor, right? So first of all, DRM is always a backdoor in the sense that DRM has to be able to run in user space, in spaces that users can't access. And right? if there's a, an icon on your desktop that says DRM, you'll just drag that shit into the trash, right? The, the thing that, that DRM has to do is hide how it works from users and stop users from tampering with it. And then, you know, one of the things that is true of, of all security, but especially of security that is brittle in the way that DRM is, in the sense that it's, it's relying on a secret that is being kept from the person who owns the device and, you know, keeping secrets from someone who owns a device that are hidden in the device is a fool's errand. So, uh, you know, one of the things that's, that, that is true of those things is that they will be broken from time to time. And so they have to have update mechanisms. And those update mechanisms have to be able to operate not only without the consent of the person who owns the device, but against their consent, because nobody wants their device updated in a way that takes away their control. And so, you know, once you combine those two things, code that runs in a way that users can't see or interdict, and code that can be updated without the user's consent and against the user's consent, then anytime a government comes along and says, ship some backdoor code, that backdoor code ships, the user doesn't see it, the user can't stop it, and then the backdoor runs in a way that the user can't interdict. You know, this may be a, a good time for you to explain the title, Attack Surface. What is an attack surface? Sure. Well, uh, attack surface is a, it, it's, it's a term from information security. And like all terms from information security gets widely abused and its definition stretches and stretches. But broadly speaking, the attack surface of a system are all the different places where an attacker can choose to uh, try to challenge it. So that would include all the different programs that run that would include all the different programs that can be installed, that would improve, that would include any update mechanisms, that would include all the users who have the power to do something to the system that would weaken its security, who might be tricked or suborned into doing it. That whole thing is the attack surface. And so the, the role of security is, is to imagine what all the attack surfaces could be and to audit each of those and find ways to mitigate all the threats that you can imagine for them. And where you find attack surfaces that have threats that can't be mitigated, you, you try to eliminate them. So you, maybe you reduce the number of people who have a, a, an administrator password, or maybe you reduce the number of programs that can run on it, or maybe you disconnect it from the internet. So all of those are ways of uh, addressing the attack surface. One of the principal locations you chose for an attack surface is the Bay Area. And the society you describe in San Francisco and Oakland uh, may seem outlandish to people who haven't been there, 
but I lived in the East Bay for four decades, and that society you describe is, was already appearing in the real world, and I made my escape in 2006 <laughs> for that reason. Am I wrong in feeling that a tax surface is not so much a fiction, but a forecast? Oh, it's definitely not a forecast. Um, the, uh, the um, you know, the, the, the thing about forecasts or, or predictions is that they're a form of fortune telling. And, you know, every fortune teller was either a fraud or delusional. Uh, there has, you know, Nostradamus is, is not a, uh, a good guy, uh, you know. Um, and so uh, I would say that rather it's a series of observations. And, uh, you know, to the extent that the present is the standing wave at which the past is becoming the future, then making observations about the past uh, and putting them in the present uh, is, is itself a kind of, of um, is itself a kind of, of uh, prediction or at least a, a something that is futuristic in and of itself. You know, setting the, the book in the Bay Area in the first place, because the, the first book, Little Brother, is, is the reason it's set in the Bay Area, was driven in part by a desire to tell a war on terror, G.W. Bush era story about a terrorist attack that takes place in a city like New York that the right hated until it gave them a pretense for uh, demanding uh, an endless war for demanding, uh, uh, you know, a, uh, a bloody revenge. You know, prior to the 9-11 uh, the attacks, if you'd asked the average Bush Republican what they thought of New York, they'd have said it was Sodom and Gomorrah and the best favor we could do to uh, America and its morals is burn it to the ground. But, you know, let Osama bin Laden send a couple of his friends to fly jets into it. And all of a sudden everybody is uh, tearing at their breast and declaring themselves to be a New Yorker. And I couldn't imagine a city that was more like that than San Francisco, right? A, a city that was even more viewed as a, a modern Sodom and Gomorrah by the Bushies than San Francisco. And so I thought, you know, what better way to heighten the contradictions than to tell a story about uh, the um, pretense that drives uh, revenge and imperialism than to have its instigating event take place in the, the city of San Francisco, which, you know, frankly, the, the entire uh, you know, uh, uh, far right evangelical population of America had been praying fervently to drop into the ocean since the moral rise of the moral majority. Um, and, you know, by the time we get to the 2020s and this story, San Francisco has got this chewy and contradictory nature in that um, it is full of techies who are profess a kind of liberalism but whose industry and whose members are building the tools of surveillance and control and who have fallen in love with technology because of the way that it freed them from authority exercised by third parties. You know, the, the, the kind of core experience of a, of a technologist is to first experience the liberating power of um, expressing your wishes in extremely precise ways such that a computer can turn them into a program that it runs over and over again cheerfully forever, and then discovering a network that allows you to take that embodiment of your will and share it around the world so that everybody in the world can run it. It's, it's not like uh, you know perfecting a brownie recipe and sharing it. It's like making a self-replicating brownie machine that makes your brownies perfectly every time and can be given away for free to as many people as you want. And then they can pass it on too. And then, and then you know, the, the third stage of the technologist journey is discovering the communities who know the words for the things you've never been able to put into language, who, who feel the things that you never knew you felt and finding in that community and fellowship a new kind of world. We should give a shout out to Oakland, which is just across the bay and where all the lefties live. Well, that's where the main action takes place. Yeah, exactly. Um, and there's a lot of scary surveillance in the book and, and a lot of talk about countermeasures for surveillance. And I'm just kind of wondering, is this something like right now today that activists and journalists should be worrying about in a big way? Should they be trying to figure out how to take the right steps? Should they be following some of the advice that Masha gives in the book? Well, you know, I, I, um, I've had a complicated relationship with uh, personal security. 
uh, and with operational security and with the kind of cypherpunk ideal, uh, which I think at its core, the cypherpunk ideal is that the illegitimate exercise of power by the state is something that we'll never be able to fully free ourselves from. And so instead, what we need to do is build a cryptographically secured demimond that exists within the state, alongside the state, where our superior code makes their inferior laws irrelevant. And, you know, certainly my first impressions of the cypherpunk movement, I found that a very thrilling and inspiring idea. I mean, I literally picked up the cypherpunk issue of Wired magazine, which was, I think, the second issue. I think the first one was the one with Bruce Sterling on the cover. Yeah, and it was I, the second issue. It had a yeah, uh, bunch of cypherpunks John, on the With John cover. Gilmore on the cover. And I took the Greyhound bus to the University of Waterloo from Toronto. I was going to university there and commuting a couple of days a week. And I read it on the Greyhound bus. And I just read Bruce's, uh, uh, the transcript of Bruce's speech to the computer game developers conference on uh, being thoroughly weird and, and uh, being spiky and not well-rounded and so on. And within a week, I dropped out of university, <laughs> you know. So I definitely found that view very exciting. But the reality is that um, the thing that defends you against the state is legitimacy and the rule of law. That the state always has access to an all-powerful cryptanalysis tool, which is called rubber hose cryptanalysis, which is when they tie you to a chair and hit you with a rubber hose until you tell them what your passphrase is. It really doesn't matter how many uh, bits you add to your key length or how strong your, your, your password is if there is no way to check the illegitimate exercise of state power. And so I've come to understand the power and promise of cryptography as on the one hand, providing a temporary shelter, a place that is shielded, albeit imperfectly, from the illegitimate exercise of state power in which we can use the temporary respite to plan uh, the reforms and the demands that will make the state more responsive and legitimate. And on the other hand, shifts some of the equilibrium because states that are tilting towards illegitimacy have to reckon with the possibility that the, the people who live there will be able to resist them through cryptographic tools. And that, that you know, if you are a journalist or if you're an activist, you should absolutely take advantage of good operational security advice. I mean, the Electronic Frontier Foundation's surveillance self-defense kit is a great place to start. But you shouldn't expect that that's the end, right? That's where you start, not where it finishes. Where it finishes is with the work of activists and journalists, holding power to account, insisting on legitimacy, insisting on democracy and the rule of law. And anything less than that is, is not going to be successful in the long term. So just to mention in the book, uh, the protagonist, Masha, is actually sort of working for the dark side, but also trying to help the light side, you might say, uh, to kind of balance things out. And I just want to read a little quote here where she says, why did all the idealists in my life have to be so committed to personally making a difference rather than finding a comfortable place from which to watch the great forces of historic inevitability play out? I mean, there's a lot of ethical conflict going on within Masha and within her head. And uh, um, I just wonder if that's something that you yourself have been feeling, these kinds of ethical conflicts. Well, look, 2020, you know, the, the temptation to just sit this one out because it's so overwhelming is all powerful and pervasive. And I have to tell you, I haven't taken a day off, not a Saturday, not a Sunday since March, since the lockdown. And it's getting to me. I've got, I just scheduled some time off, uh, but I, I couldn't do it immediately because I got too much important stuff to do that where I found a way that I can make a difference in the world and I'm going to do it, God damn it. And uh, it is a hard challenge to figure out when you need to take a break because you're undermining your own efficacy by uh, not taking care of yourself and when you need to push forward because everything is on fire and things are terrible and there are so many people who have it worse than you and if you were in their shoes and you were watching someone in your shoes who had it so much better than they did would you forgive them 
for engaging in self-care or would you expect them to move heaven and earth to help them and the people they love? Yeah. And it's hard for us to figure out just what we can do. Um, you have a, a voice that's amplified somewhat and that's great. And, and we do to an extent too, but I can tell you that there've been many nights that I've uh, said, I'm not going to, I'm not going to watch the news tomorrow. I'm not going to touch my phone. And you know what the first thing I do in the morning is I pick up my phone and start reading the news. It's hard to get away from it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's my plan for my break. I'm, I'm, uh, you know, this is also the crisis of the COVID pandemic, right? So I'm like making my list of things that I'm going to do during my break. And it's like, well, I'm going to have long, luxurious Zoom hangout friend with friends, not meetings or cocktail hours, but like one specific friend. And I'm going to spend like an hour on the phone, lying in the hammock in the backyard, just chatting with them. And then my next resolution is I'm not going to use my phone. Well, <laughs> you yeah, know. I know it's hard to bury it, isn't it? <laughs> Well, there's another quote in here that I think this is Nisha, um, who is sort of the, the leftist friend of Masha. Um, she says, fuck victory. Fights like this aren't fights you win, they're fights you fight. And I just wonder about, I mean, I think that's a great quote. And um, I just wonder if it means that we're always going to be in conflict mode, that we all, that the fight is never over. Well, okay, look, of course the fight isn't over in the sense that the world isn't static, right? Like if you were, if you were to enact a utopian program that solved all the problems of the world, uh, that program wouldn't be done because uh, the world is subject to exogenous shocks, right? Like, I mean, imagine that we had perfected human civilization by March of 2019 and then the pandemic hit. We'd still have to struggle because the system that is perfect for a world without a pandemic is not perfect for the world that is that does have a pandemic. And you know what? There's no obvious perfect adaptation, which means that people of goodwill who all agree on what the end goal should be are going to have irreconcilable differences on how to arrive at it. And those irreconcilable differences will multiply into really serious fights and rifts. I mean, I've been there. I've been an activist for you know most of my life. I was raised by activists. And I, I'm, you know, I'm here to tell you, like, disagreements among people who agree on what should be done, but not how to do it, can be permanent rifts. Uh, and they're, and it's not because they're like uh, stiff necked ideologues. It's because, well, I'll give you an example from the world that I'm in right now. I want to save the internet. I don't give a shit about saving big tech. Uh, I think that the, the internet deserves better than uh, five giant websites filled with screenshots of the other four. And for us to have a better internet, we need to be able to uh, see new people, new market entrants, whether that's cooperatives, individuals, firms, uh, coming into the market and offering alternatives to big tech. A lot of people have given up on the idea of, of uh, fixing the internet. They think that big tech is a permanent, uh, uh, a permanent fixture on the internet. And they, um, are saying that the way that we solve the big tech problem is by making rules for tech companies that are so onerous that only a giant monopolist can possibly live up to them. You know, we say that if you op offer a platform, you have to hire enough content moderators to catch and end harassment on that platform. Okay, but that means that Facebook is the only firm that we're ever gonna get, right? And, and maybe Twitter, maybe YouTube but no one will ever do to Facebook what Facebook did to MySpace. We will never have that kind of dynamic, multifarious world. And, you know, we both want a better technology world, but if we go your way, then we can't go my way. And so it's not just that we have a stiff-necked ideological commitment to one thing or the other. It's that we are in good faith acting on the best of evidence that we can find. And according to our most careful reasoning, uh, arriving at completely irreconcilable positions. And, you know, that means that even the very best society that we build will always have struggle because there will always be shocks and the shocks will always demand a response and the response will never be a fully empirical outcome. It will always involve preferences, priorities, and qualitative elements for which there is no empirical right answer. Well, as long as we're doing quotes, uh, in your afterwards, you wrote this. 
present-day wealth concentration makes the Gilded Age look like a socialist paradise. Is there a cure for that? Well, I'll tell you why. what I think might be a cure for it. Um, I think you guys probably know Jamie Boyle at, the, at Duke University at the, the um, Center for the Public Domain. Uh, he's the Scottish lawyer who lives in, uh, in, in, in North Carolina. And um, he has got this whole analogy that he draws to the history of the ecology movement. He says, you know, there was once a time when like some people cared about owls and other people cared about whales. They didn't think they were on the same fight, right? Maybe they, they thought that the other person's fight was good, but they, um, but they didn't think that they were on the, in the same fight. And then the term ecology came along and it turned 1000 issues into a single movement with a thousand ways to get involved. And it created solidarity among people who had different priorities within ecology but who were themselves ecologists. And I think we stand on the brink of an ecology moment for monopolism and for uh, self-determination and pluralism, where there are people who are angry and upset about the outcomes of various kinds of monopolies and oligarchies who don't know that the problem is oligarchy itself. They think that their circumstances are uniquely horrible, right? Like if you're a pro wrestling fan, you might think that it is uniquely horrible that the 20 leagues that we used to have have collapsed down into one league and that the billionaire who owns it, Vince McMahon, has reclassified all of his entertainers as contractors and taken away their health insurance. And now they're all dying of work-related injuries in their 50s and they have no insurance and they're begging on GoFundMe for pennies so they can die with dignity, right? But you're not angry about wrestling. Vince McMahon is not a, an evil super genius. He is an ordinary sociopathic mediocrity acting in exactly the same way that all those people who wonder why the GM plant in their city shut down and uh, or GE plant right in their city shut down and why GE now buys its light bulbs from Chinese subcontractors um, are uh, and, and are scarred by that, right? They have um, the same cause as all of the people in the UK who saw the largest UK outsourced government service provider, a Carillion that provided all of the uh, you know, rubber meets the road work of government, trash pickup and social services and so on, they collapsed. And it turned out that they had billions of dollars in debt and millions of dollars in assets, billions in debt, millions in assets. They collapsed owing the government vast sums of money, their employees vast sums of money, and they left the government with no operational capacity. And the big four accountancy firms signed off on every one of their financial statements. They falsified their financial statements for years. Um, and you might think that you're pissed off about corruption in the accounting industry, but you're really pissed off about monopoly. You might think that you're pissed off that there's only two brewing companies or one eyewear company or four movie studios or three record labels um, or five publishers or, or, you know, two brewers. But what you're really pissed off is about monopoly. And when the ecology movement ar moment arrives and when people who are angry about all these different things realize that it, it's the same thing, then the solidarity will be incredibly powerful. And the change that we can imagine arising from that is really without limit. So there's a point in your book where Masha is kind of talking about or thinking about disinformation campaigns and she thinks, oh shit, we made a monster. Um, but then she seems to kind of go on and think that the monster loses its teeth over time. Hmm. Do you think that I mean, does that kind of happen? Do you think all this disinformation, fake news, conspiracy blather and bullshit that we're seeing online is is losing ground that people are kind of getting it or just weary of it? I don't know that I understand the question. Could you maybe rephrase it a little? Uh, sure. Well, I mean, so she says we made a monster, but then she she thinks about it some more and and she seems to think that it's not as you know, that eventually people are, will be on to it. That's kind of the impression that I got when I read that passage. And I just wonder if, I mean, obviously we've been swimming in a world of like constant barrages of lies and fake news and conspiracy theories uh, through social media, uh, much of it striking people who are uh, at least initially gullible 
And I guess my question is whether over time people start to get it, whether your thought is that eventually people are going to be kind of on to that or at least sure. get really tired of it, you know? Well, look, I think that um, I think that persuasive techniques have a limited shelf life, right? That that uh, human beings adapt to stimulus, uh, and so novel stimulus can can evince a strong reaction at the beginning, but it it fades with time. So you know, like when we started this call, I forgot that I had the washing machine on here in my office, and it wasn't until the washing machine switched cycles that I could even hear it, uh, because although the sound is very annoying when it starts it ceases being annoying almost immediately. And I think that there's an analogy in there to you know people who walk into a casino and put a quarter in a slot machine for the first time and for a couple hours just find themselves feeding quarters into it, being really excited by the way that the numbers almost hit the line and you know getting to understand it and starting to maybe have a little of that kind of false pattern recognition where they think, oh, it's about to hit, it's about to pay off. But for almost everyone, the impact of prolonged exposure to that kind of stimulus is for uh, is inurement, right? Most people wander away from slot machines when it's done. Now, it must be said that there are people who stay on the slots, right? Until like, you know, they've cashed out their kids' uh, uh, college fund and they're, you know, investing heavily in adult diapers, right? And they dropped out of a heart attack in front of the slots. They are what keeps the slot machines in business, but they are not a large group of people. It's only because the slot machines extract so much money per whale that they are profitable um, because the actual number of whales is very small. And the same is true for scratch and wins. And the same is true for a lot of other kind of novel stimulus. You know, do you remember when Upworthy headlines started and they felt so compelling, right? Like, here's 11 ways that dolphins are like humans and one way in which they're totally different, you know? And it was very hard not to click that at one point. And then it just became completely boring. It became a, a, a commonplace and a cliche and then a joke and then you know a distant memory. And it's because the number of people who, uh, or the number of dollars that you get per click from an upworthy headline is so small that the number of people who remain vulnerable to it, that six sigma of vulnerability, uh, do not sustain an upworthy style uh, business model. Um, it's the same thing that happened with Zynga and Farmville, right? There are people who are as addicted to Farmville as we all were when it first launched. There's just not enough of them to sustain Farmville. Uh, you know, they, because the actual revenue per user is so small in Farmville, you actually need a lot of people to stay addicted. I mean, I guess it's a version we can feel, fool some of the people some of the time and uh, uh, all of the people, blah, 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 but you can't fool all the people all the time, that over time we, we become inured. And so I think that a lot of the tactics that are used to convince us will fade over time. Whether there will be new tactics, I'm sure there will be, um, and whether they will uh, find the same people being vulnerable or whether they'll be as long-lived and sturdy as the existing disinformation tactics have been, it remains to be seen. But, um, you know, I, I am confident in saying that the current generation of persuasion, manipulation, and control techniques uh, will fade with time. You know, it's a separate question we talk about kids because because they haven't had a chance to like build up those attentional calluses. Uh, so they get, you know, like they get all of the, they're like a time traveler showing up from the past with no antibodies, you know, uh, in, a, in an environment in which there is, um, you know, every imaginable evolved pathogen floating around and attacking them. But, but you know, for the median person, I think that we will mostly become inured to most of those tactics. Yeah, it's making me think about how Q seems to have lost some of its gloss. And apparently, some people think that Ron Watkins was Q, you know, the guy that was kind of like running the system. Uh, what was it? Eight, uh, it wasn't eight chan. Eight, it was eight the, coon. Yeah, eight coon. Um, apparently Ron Watkins got really sick of what he was doing and decided to go off and build furniture or something like that. Huh. And he may have been, you know, Q or maybe his dad was Q or whatever. Right. But whatever the case, the Q drops stopped coming. And, uh, I haven't heard more about this in a few days, but, but, uh, yeah. I had heard that the Q drops had stopped for a long enough period of time that, 
the people who were sort of in the cult were starting to question whether they had been duped in the first uh, place, you know? You know, I bet we'll see. A re I, I, I think the tactic hasn't played out, though. So that's a slightly different phenomenon. That's the that's the, the referee getting tired of the game. The dungeon master got tired and folded up his uh, screen and took his polyhedral dice and went home. But there's still a lot of people hungry to play D&D. Um, and so there will be more people who engage this facility. I mean, you know, I think all the people who've written about the connections between ARGs and uh, Q are really yeah. onto something. I remember, you know, maybe you were even there going to the uh, O'Reilly Emerging Tech Conference, uh, you know, probably in San Diego by that point. Yeah. And hearing people like Elon Lee talk about their experience building uh, uh, alternative reality games and saying like, we would, uh, we would make mistakes, we'd forget stuff. And our um, users would find a way in which that stuff could be fit into the game and they would write it into the game. And you know that was very powerful for them. And the game masters were watching what the users came up with. So you know, I remember them saying that in the uh, AI game, they left in some fragments of pseudocode and the users back formed a full programming language out of those fragments, um, which they then started writing code in for the game, which they then started dropping more code samples in for the game, as if the people who had back formed this programming language had actually um, solved the riddle of what the whole programming language should be, when in fact, there was no riddle. The riddle only came into existence when they uh, when they decided that there must be a riddle and went ahead and solved it. And so that model is basically what happens with Q, right? I gave a, a talk last week where I talked about how, how we are trained so well to suspend disbelief, you know, mm. partly through exposure to all kinds of fictions and, you know, just all the various exercises we go through where the willing suspension of disbelief is a big part of it. And that we have suspended disbelief so readily for so long that we just do it probably more readily than we should. Yeah, well, I think that's absolutely the, the case. But I, but I think there's something slightly different going on here, which is that, um, we, that there, is a, there is a cult leader, right? Whoever Q is or whoever, whatever people Q are, who has figured out how to tap into the same intrinsically pleasurable experience of collectively trying to find meaning out of a mixture of random noise and uh, real world, um, you know, uh, planned deliberate riddle making. And uh, the combination of the community, the camaraderie, the puzzle solving, the imaginative elements of it um, is itself extremely compelling. And then you throw in the in-group, out-group political stuff, the culture war stuff, and it becomes clearly very powerful. Again, I, I think that it's likely that the power is of limited duration, that, there's, that it's got a sell-by date, that while there will be some people who are uh, really, um, uh, you know, really susceptible over the long term, that there won't be enough of them to sustain it as a as a mass cultural phenomenon. It'll become something off in the fringes like Second Life or ballet, you know, something that a small number of people really, really care about and that uh, most people don't and it ceases to be a kind of cultural force and instead is like just a, uh, a, a peripheral community. It all sounds a bit like Star Wars fan fiction. You know, George Lucas has stopped writing, but the stories keep coming out of, out of nowhere and uh, it's very similar kind of, a phenomenon. Yeah, although I think actually fan fiction is slightly different again. Um, I think that uh, fan fiction, I mean, there's certainly elements of that, right? People want to connect the dots. Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the best pieces of writing advice I ever got was from uh, James McDonald, who uh, is, you know, ex-military and wanted to, um, and was giving advice to writers about how to put guns into a story because gun nuts are really, really into um, uh, figuring out what's wrong with your portrayal of guns. <laughs> it's like a, a hobby for gun nuts. And he said, look, if you want to uh, really engage gun nuts uh, and make them very happy, whenever you mention a gun, put the word modified in front of it. 
right? He, he, he snapped off three quick rounds with his modified Walther PPK. They will then go to enormous lengths to figure out what amazingly cool, knowledgeable thing you have done to make your modified Walther PPK work that way and will attribute to you enormous knowledge and sensitivity and creativity in the realm of fictional firearms. So that's, that's kind of what I'm talking about. I think with fanfic, it's a little different. I think that um, the way that we have an aesthetic experience of fiction, the reason that like the imaginary plight of people who never lived, never died, never suffered anything and don't exist and are therefore totally inconsequential, the reason that that plight actually grips us is because we have a, an unconscious and automatic process by which we um, uh, try to build models of the people we know and the people we encounter in our minds so that we can predict what they might do. You know, if you try to imagine what your mom would say about the state of your room, even if your mom's not alive, you can probably imagine that because you've got a kind of model of who she is. And we build that model up automatically. We build it without any kind of uh, conscious intervention. And to the extent that a book works, right? The reason we have an aesthetic response, the reason we have a limbic response and we laugh and we cry and we gasp and we cheer for imaginary people doing inconsequential things is because this naive, automatic, deep-seated part of our mind that models other people is subjecting our models to the plight of the imaginary person. And that is how we experience empathy for them. And I think that in the same way that you can imagine what your mom might say today if she were here, even though she's dead, if she's dead, you can imagine what uh, a fictional character might do or say in this world today, even though the book has been closed because the model is not cycled out uh, it might lose fidelity over time as it has failed to be refreshed with new information, but the model lives on, irrespective of whether it's about a real person or a, a, an imaginary person, a live person or a dead person. You know, you can you might hear uh, stories from your friend about his college buddy, Crazy Joey. You've never met Crazy Joey, but you've heard so many stories. You've got a, a whole model of Crazy Joey, and you can probably imagine what Crazy Joey would do in a circumstance even though you've never met him. And so in that same way, fanfic is the imagined continued existence of someone who you had to turn into an, a semi-autonomous, subconsciously created model. Otherwise, the story would have just been a five-finger exercise, right? Would have just been imaginary things happening to inconsequential people. Helps if I punch the right button here. I hear you. <laughs> uh, I'm going to throw something else at you from your afterward. You said that you you wrote that you cut forty thousand words. Yeah. Story. Is there a chance some of those forty thousand will appear in some future work? Nah. Nah. They just I cut it. The book was way too long, and I was really struggling. I actually worked with an outside editor to get it to get that to happen. Julie Dalman. Uh, and she had a great idea. So the, the original conception of the story is that um, uh, Masha had a lover in the, the post-Soviet Republic that she starts off in, a guy who's a resistance leader who, you know, at night she, she helps the state spy on him and, or, or by day she helps the state, state spy on him, by night she helps him evade the surveillance. And you know, the contradiction of this is one of the things that drives her out of the country and breaks up their relationship. And she spends some time on her way back to America in Berlin, where she meets the sidekick character, Christina, who then accompanies her to America. And they go off and they do a bunch of stuff in America together. Um, and so she is in this mentorship relationship with this young woman, even as she's uh, exploring her relationship as the protege of these two older women who are surveillance people. Who one, one is an ex-German, East German uh, surveillance colonel, and the other one's an ex-US military uh, surveillance operative. And, um, and so it's about like heightening those contradictions or those contrasts between her role as a protege and her role as a mentor, and the way that women mentor one another, and the way that they replicate uh, the kind of worst aspects of toxic ma masculinity sometimes in those mentorship relationships, all of that stuff. And Juliet was like, I've got a great idea to make this book a lot shorter. Lose the boyfriend altogether. Make Christina the sidekick. Make her into the rebel back in the post-Soviet Republic. Have Masha leave her behind and have that protege mentor relationship take place across the ocean from this great distance with all of the peril that that implies where you are worried about someone 
who you can't be engaged with, who you can't um, help directly, and and that that will heighten the drama and also shave off forty thousand words, both of which turned out to be true. I think. Was it a little bit painful though to uh, kill off basically those words that you had spent so much time creating? You know, not really. I actually find um, so. So here's a thing about about. Uh, writing and any other discipline that is largely pursued independently with very little external feedback during the production, right? Where you, it's not like you have a coach who meets with you every day at the swimming pool and helps you work on your stroke, right? You write the whole thing. Maybe you're in a writer's group or maybe you've got an editor who, who gives you feedback, but for the most part, you are using your own introspection and uh, your own self-reflection to try and improve your work. And it is very easy in those circumstances to take the things that you already know how to do to make your work better and just do more of them. So, you know, I'm, I'm pretty glib. I've got a lot of, got a lot of glibness privilege. And so I, I write pretty good sentences and I can go back and I can really polish those sentences and make them really nice. And for a long time, that's mostly what I did. And so even though the books were long, all the sentences were great you know, and so it, it was okay. And then I started working on making stuff shorter, um, in part, I think, because of the discipline that I learned writing on Twitter. And with Walk Away, I was able to take 20% of the book and just rip it out just by tightening each sentence, one sentence at a time. And what I realized is that while practicing my glibness might take me from sort of a 98% uh, uh, proficiency to a 98.1% proficiency, that working on tightening something that I never put any energy into could take me from a 5% proficiency to a 25% proficiency. In other words, I could realize a five-fold gain in my, in my uh, capabilities but simply by devoting myself to this thing that I was bad at rather than doing the comfortable thing that I was good at. And while doing the thing that you are bad at feels uncomfortable, making improvements feels amazing. And so the... Um, actual lived experience of cutting those words was amazing because I came away from it having become a, a much better writer, right? Having taken an, an area of weakness and shored it up enormously. It's still not my strength, right? But it is now like a, a moderately developed skill that I, I can work on some more. And, you know, I just did this Kickstarter for the audiobook of Attack Surface uh, and it was very, very successful. Um, you know, my publisher didn't want to pay me for uh, the audiobook rights to Attack Surface because I won't allow DRM on my work, which means it can't be sold on Audible or on iTunes, uh, which is the, you know, 95% of the market. Sure. And so I decided I'd record it myself. I got um, Amber Benson from Buffy uh, to go into this wonderful uh, studio with this amazing director, Skyboat Media and Cassandra DeClaire, and then my, you know, brilliant uh, sound editor, John Taylor Williams, who does my podcast every week, edited and mixed it down. And it, it was great and I kickstarted it. And one of the things I did for the Kickstarter was I offered a premium where for a thousand dollars, I would copy out by hand that aborted last chapter of the first draft, which almost no one has ever seen, a couple of first readers. Uh, and I would send it to you to do with as you will. And so I only did two of those because I suck at writing by hand. Um, I learned to type while I was learning to write you know, block letters. And so I never really got good at writing by hand. And uh, I, what I found was that the act of copying out the manuscript found so many areas for improvement just by slowing me down that I've decided that with the book I'm working on now, which is a, a utopian post Green New Deal novel about truth and reconciliation with white nationalist militias called The Lost Cause, that when it's done, I'm going to copy it out. I'm going to copy out like three pages a day for as long as it takes. And I'm going to make edits. I'm going to do it in front of my computer and make edits while I copy it out. Not because anyone ever needs to see my unreadable handwritten version of the manuscript, but because the act of copying it out is going to make it a better book. And, no, and I, I, I love that. I recall there was a novelist and I think his name was John Carroll that I spent some time with uh, many years ago, but he talked about how uh, he always writes his first draft by hand and maybe even his second draft. And it was for just that reason. It was yep. just a different kind of experience and it really helped him get closer to the, to the work. Well, um, you know, the, uh, the, uh, 
Neil Stevenson did this for the System of the World books. He wrote them out with fountain pen. But I mean, even more interesting was Linda Berry when she was writing Cruddy uh, found herself blocked. And, you know, she's a cartoonist and she paints the, she paints each frame of her cartoon and she got out her India ink pot and her paintbrush and she lettered it with her paintbrush in cursive the way she does her comic, Ernie Pooks Comique. And the manuscript apparently ran to like, you know, 1500 pages because she was getting five words a page, but she was able to write the whole thing that way. I'm doing something a little different here because I'm not proposing that I can't compose without um, working longhand. I'm just saying that writing it back longhand is going to be a reflective exercise that causes the kind of individuated attention to word sentences, phrases, and scenes that is easy to lose track of when you are writing very quickly with a typewriter, you know, or with a, with a keyboard. One of, my, one of my favorite things to do is peruse old punch annuals, uh, punch gazetteers. So punch is this satirical newspaper, from, Victorian satirical newspaper from, from London. And, and I have all these 19th century gazetteers where they bound together old back numbers in a single set of hardcovers. And the little news blips are the best part. And one of my favorite ones is, um, uh, a gentleman from America has invented a type writing machine that will allow you to write down your thoughts faster than you can think them. No more will we have to suffer with the indignity of bad tavern nibs. <laughs> <laughs> ah. That's great. We, uh, we are actually about at the end of our hour. And uh, I guess my last question would be whether you have anything to add. Or anything you want to tell people about? Hmm. Well, I guess, you know, the uh, attack surface is out. It's doing well. It just got nominated for a Prometheus Award. I think it's my fourth Prometheus nomination. Um, and it is, uh, it has drawn really uh, good early notices. Uh, you know, I've, I've heard good things from the Washington Post and from other critical outlets. Um, the audiobook is available for, available for sale everywhere where they sell audiobooks that isn't Amazon or iTunes. You can get them direct from me at craphound.com slash shop or from downpour.com or libro.fm or even Google Play, which allows uh, optional DRM, doesn't have mandatory DRM. It seems very cinematic, too. When will the film come out? Well, you know, um, the, <laughs> the option that Paramount had lapsed. Uh, my agent is uh, at William Morris, and they are currently shopping it around, so we'll see what happens. Oh, that'd be great. Well, thanks, Corey. Thanks so much for joining us. Oh, thank you. It's always a pleasure to talk to you guys. I'm so you can follow the Plutopia News Network at Plutopia.io. On Facebook, go to at Plutopia News. On Twitter, it's at Plutopia. With John Lubkowski, I'm Scoop Sweeney. This is the Plutopia News Network, 20 minutes into the future.